production funding for Living Smart with Patricia Gross is underwritten in part by Halliburton. Did you know compatibility may be more important than love for a long-term relationship? Learn the questions to ask when doing the mating dance as you search for that special other to find lasting contentment. Next on Living Smart. I'm Patricia Gross. Welcome to Living Smart, the show designed to help you get the most out of life. Today's guest is a very wise and sensible woman, family therapist Nan Halenke. She will share some hot tips on her recipe for finding the right mate. So have pen and paper ready. We'll be giving out resource information at the end of the program. I spent the first 35 years of my life thinking, feeling, and observing. Quiet. And really, other than finding out what people want and telling them what it's going to cost, you don't have to talk when you're landscaping. It's a moving meditation for me. Nan Hall Linky enjoys spending time in the garden she herself landscaped. As with nature, death and renewal is something she can relate to. She reinvents herself often, following her soul's path by doing what she wants, even if that means going against her own introverted nature. Today, her passions have become her occupations. She's a master landscaper, an astrologer, and for most, a family therapist. When I found a profession, I was going to have to talk. And I was going to have to learn how to talk in a way that would make a difference in people's lives quickly. And so I started studying all of the psycholinguistic skills and hypnosis and designed some systems of communication that I teach. In all three professions, she's had to do a bit of talking, something she didn't enjoy doing while growing up. I had an alcoholic family, so, you know, the, the word in an alcoholic family is don't talk, don't trust, don't feel. So I just didn't uh, find that my communication was welcomed, and so I just kept quiet. Keeping quiet, she learned to go to school, excel in academics, and listen. I always loved school. It's the only place people didn't tell me I was crazy and they didn't want to hear what I had to say. I learned to listen very intently at what people were saying because I noticed that what they said was often not what they did. What I find is that, that communication is about verbal and nonverbal. It's about what you hear and what you don't hear. It's what you feel. It's what you sense. Nan is an eternal student. After a bachelor's degree in international studies, she became interested in astrology. I went to this lady, and she knew me better than, at that point, the psychoanalyst I'd had for two years, and I'd just given her my date, place, and time of birth. So I thought, you know, I need to study this because this would be a good tool. She opened her astrology practice in 1971, began to read every book she could on the subject, and eventually got a publicist to promote her practice. I could tell people things and I could give them insight, but I didn't know anything about problem solving or really could answer their questions. That's when she decided to get a master's degree in marriage and family counseling at the University of Houston, Clear Lake. It was kind of a compliment to astrology because family therapy was kind of the edgy part of psychology in the 70s because it had been founded by hypnotists and people that really saw the whole system as one. Throughout her life, Nan immersed herself in books to understand herself and those around her. But suffering played a major role in her ability to help others. When I was 18 and moved to North Africa, I was attacked by a pack of wild dogs, and uh, my left leg was torn pretty much to pieces. So that was certainly a cause for reflection. In 1968, when I was uh, in that uh, bicycle accident, and then um, when I moved back to Texas, when I got married, I married a man who became a drug addict and uh, bankrupted us, and the IRS took my house. Nan says she's also survived 22 car wrecks, which taught her the relationship between mind and body and how to heal herself. I have uh, made a decision early in my life to become an optimist. I totally believe in the grace of God. I believe that I'm very spiritually obedient, and I always look for the lesson in things, and I know that as a door closes, another one opens. I also uh, believe that the Buddhists probably got it right that we get equal blessings and equal sorrow. And I have had blessings equal to and in surpassing of my traumas. She counsels her greatest blessings, her family, especially 
her twin granddaughters. I've created a healthy, happy, functioning family after not coming from one. I think my greatest failure, I don't really know what that would be because as an optimist, I don't even believe in failure. There you go. Nan Hall Linky, great to have you back again. Thanks so much for having me. Now, you said that men audition and women shop. Where did you get that philosophy? Well, actually, it's men audition, women choose. choose. And it's not and a philosophy, choose. it's part of biology. In all species, other than the human kingdom of the last 40 years, that is the truth. Mm -hmm. You don't see women auditioning if they're a girl cat or a girl dog. What you call this is presenting behavior on the part of a male. A female sends out her pheromone or her scent, and that's a biological truth. In fact, the latest research on pheromones says that people respond to them even though they don't know that's what's happening. Wow, so it's a chemistry. It's, a, it's, it's basically how we're hardwired. We're okay. downloaded to do this. And social conditioning over the last 40 years has reversed that, and part of the reason we have such a mess in relationships is that women are auditioning and men are choosing, which is not really in accordance with nature. The way it's supposed to be. And you studied birds. Why birds instead of other well, mammals? Well, I'm going to be honest. Um, I tend to believe that life is alive and we get cues and clues and we're supposed to track our life. And one year... I noticed that all these feathers were falling all around me. And I said, well, gee, I'm supposed to do something with birds. And then I happened to read in the newspaper that they were having a master bird watcher course. And as you know, I love to go to school. That's well, right. okay. <laughs> so I called the head one space. I said, oh, it's got to be mine. So for one year, I studied the birds with all these scientists and bird watchers and got a bird watching certificate from Cornell University. During that one year, they proved that the birds had descended from the dinosaurs. And I thought, you know, Darwin got it right when he chose the finches. Birds are the most adapted species still surviving on Earth, so I need to study everything about them. Well, the most interesting thing about birds is their courtship behavior. And the great uh, David Attenborough did a 12-hour series on bird courtship. Right. And I taped it, watched it. I mean, and it's interesting because in, in the bird kingdom, the females definitely are in control. We know this with March of the Penguins last year. Right. And the male bird has to sing, he has to dance, he has to build a nest, he has to decorate the nest, he has to feed the young, he has to, uh, you know, hatch the eggs. So we know the birds have survived longer than anybody else because they adhere to these biological truths. So I thought, well, why not let's find a way to take this into the human kingdom and see if we can make some improvement. So the men need to audition. And, and women, women need, need to choose. choose. And we know that women know how to shop better than anything else. <laughs> so what I tell my clients that are female is you need to get in the well man store, the feeling man store, and you may get the wrong model in the beginning, but you just keep shopping. Keep shopping. Now, you, you mentioned something that the relationships between men and women are getting more complicated, more difficult. And you, you said why. Why did that happen? Because I believe, and this is, you know, probably not going to get everyone's approval, that when the birth control pill developed, which was supposed to give us great freedom, it gave us basically a prison camp called changing the dating behavior and auditioning. Okay. And, you know, for thousands of years before there was birth control, which I totally approve of and support, women knew to stay with biology. Once the biological rules changed, then we had to go with the fact that women, by nature, have a relational brain, they want to be approved of, they want you to like them. So when men said, oh, there's no excuse for you not to have sex with me, women started having sex with men before the man fall in love, fell in love. And we know that women have hormones of attachment when they have sex, men do not. So the women got attached, men essentially reacted to that, and I think the whole thing has been a mess for 40 years. So, the, so in a way, birth control, women acting like men when it comes to sex, stop the, cur the courting game, right, which is what you need to have a better bonding. Right, courtship and time, and women bond through sex. So when women bonded and men didn't, we have a mess. When choosing uh, your mate, what should you be looking for? What are some of the things you should be looking for for a long-term relationship? Well, you know, generally speaking, we know that people need to have similar values toward how they spend money. They also need to have similar work ethics. They also need to have similar spiritual views. And we know they, if they're going to have children, they need to have similar beliefs about how to rear children. Now, those okay. are, you know, kind of the givens. But that was not enough for me. I thought, you know, Joseph Campbell in his fabulous book, The Power of Myth, in the chapter on romantic love, he said that the young woman was not allowed to leave her family until she found a male that had the five traits of a medieval knight. 
Mm, and I, like I said, that. well, you know, those traits are not going to work today. So each woman <laughs> needs to say what her five traits are. Right. And they're usually character values. They're the things that you have that others don't that drive you crazy. So mm. I always say to women, write a list of your five most developed traits. Like it could be courage. It could be optimism. It could be tenacity. It could be many things. Ask your friends. And know that anybody that's going to be your mate needs to have three of those five. Okay. And then I thought, well, you know, let's take that number five to another level because studies have shown that once you quit making your sexual chemistry as intently, you need to have things in common. So I always say, well, make a list of the five things you enjoy or would like to enjoy, and your mate needs to have three of those in common with you. Right. So at least you have a foundation of similarity because what we find if people feel mirrored, they tend to feel comfortable and in resonance. Now, I heard as a child two things that just puzzled me to death. One was... Opposites attract, and like attracts like. And I saw both of those things as true. But as I got older, I realized that when we're young and we need the friction of development, we're attracted to our opposite. Not a good thing for a long-term mate, okay? <laughs> Some of us have made this mistake already, okay? That's right. <laughs> and uh, then the other thing is like attracts like. And right. invariably, as people get particularly into their fourth decade, they begin to say, I want the complementary relationship right. that's soothing because life is such a struggle by now. Right. right. You're so tired. You're tired. Things have you happened to you. You want the comfort right. of somebody who mirrors and reflects you. What do men want in a relationship and what do women want? Is, is there a difference? Well, I think there's a huge difference because we have different brains and finally we have real evidence that gender is neurological. And I think men want a woman who is beautiful because they are visual. They want somebody who looks good to them, and that's mm -hmm. individual preferences. They also want a woman who's happy okay. and, and confident because men are so baffled and bewildered by women, they don't want to figure us out because they can't. <laughs> so a woman needs to know how to make herself happy and how to communicate her needs to a man. And mm -hmm. as we talked about before, three sentences only, otherwise she sounds like an egg. Men also, in my experience, want acknowledgement. They want to be complimented and praised and acknowledged for the things they do well. Women don't realize how important this is. They also, when they come home in the evening, they usually want a welcome home ritual that acknowledges their presence in the home. That's another thing I find that people are too busy for these days. Mm -hmm. Now, I think women want constant reaffirmation that they're beautiful. I think they also want somebody who's a protector, a provider, and someone who will listen to their feelings. What I always tell men is that whatever your woman is talking about, here's what you're supposed to say. I'm so sorry that happened to you. What can I do to help? And if they will just be comforting during a woman's emotional difficulties, people tend to work things through. When you're interested in, in hooking up with someone and mating with someone, what are some of the questions you should ask him to find out more about him? Well, I think the first thing you should ask anybody is what is the worst thing that ever happened to you and how did you get over it? If nothing's ever happened, then that person is kind of untested. Mm -hmm. If they haven't gotten over it, then maybe it's a little soon to pursue the relationship. But if you hear yourself listening to their story and saying, oh, that happened to me, and that's what I did to get over it, you're probably shopping in the right store. Okay. And, you know, I think that a man's relationship to his mother is very important because she was the first woman in authority in his life. And how he got along and gets along with her says something about his ability to share power. Over the last 20 years, we've given women permission to have more and more power and authority, and men need to have the ability to share power with a woman and not challenge it. Mm -hmm. Now, now, most of us have made this mistake, and, and, and I one? call it a mistake just out of experience, choosing the idea or the concept that there's a soulmate out right. there for you. Well, there may be, but I think it's not in the way that we think about it. The idea that it's a romantic fulfillment partner turns not to be true. If there is such a thing as a soulmate, it's a person who's going to change your life dramatically. And... Years ago, I was doing a workshop in Dallas, and there were probably 10 people in the workshop who had met their soulmate. 10 out of the 10 had lost the soulmate to death. Mm -hmm. So the soulmate is maybe someone you meet who shapes your life in ways you never would know, but it's not going to be that day-to-day -day life partner in my experience. Right, the, the long-term so relationship. So the longing that... for that is kind of like an idealization. It also tends to lead us into that trap of narcissism, which is the magical thinking of perfection.
Okay, now let's talk about chemistry and compatibility. You okay. meet someone, you get sweaty hands, mm -hmm. your heart starts to shake, you just can't speak. Right, I always tell people that's not love, that's allergy. <laughs> and, you know, somehow the universe has conspired to, to give you a person who looks good to you and looks desirable to you, but probably has many of the features of your unhealed relationships in the past. Okay. So I always pay attention to that because, you know, thank God that still happens to me. And I go, oh, how interesting. I wonder what this person represents that I need to pay attention to so I can go back to the inner drawing board and review and revise. Because believe me, years ago I heard uh, someone say chemistry leads to, a, to addiction. And I thought, you know what, mm. that's true. Interesting. So when you get to that point, you're like, he's the one, he's the one, because I There's, feel all yeah. these physical things. Right. It, it, That's be called careful. projection. And okay. we all know that is going to leave you between 12 and 18 months. So if you need to do that still, <laughs> do not get married. You know, stay in the relationship and let the projections fall off so that you can see who he really is. Because you said that, that men actually bond to women and, 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 differently. and uh, differently than women. When they have sex, they don't feel the same when we have sex. They don't have oxytocin. They don't nurse. So what we know is the chemistry that causes the bonding with a woman and her infant is the same chemistry that causes a woman who's had sex to bond with a man. A man, a man bonds through his activity, his giving to you, his participation in your life. That's why so many men marry women who need them okay. because that act of doing for and caring for is what creates his bonding mechanism. And that's why women now let men play with the babies, take care with the babies, and you see that the men bond just as well as the women do. Interesting. Now, the book that just came out, He's Not That Into You, was very popular. What does that say about relationships between men and women? How does a woman know a man is not that into you? Okay, this is a great book. I recommend it to everybody. <laughs> he says many things that I've said, but nobody believed me because I'm not a male. <laughs> And I remember when I was newly single years ago, and I had a really good guy friend who I chose as my dating coach. And I said to him, how do you know when a man is into a woman? He said, it's simple, man. He asks her out over and over and over again. And I went, that couldn't be that easy. But it really is. And so what this book does is it gives women some information they need about how to interpret male behavior. One of the things that women do, because we have a ping pong ball sometimes brain, is we say, oh, he's doing this, maybe it means that, maybe it means that. We try to, you know, crazy <laughs> to ideas interpret everything. to interpret everything <laughs> instead of, he's just not that into you. Right. So what the book did is it really said, if he does these behaviors, he's just not that into you, and here's what he does when he's into you. Right, so going after him and calling oh, him forget and it. pursuing forget it. him, forget that's it. not the biological no. thing to do, no. correct? I mean, in you fact, just one let of my him favorite, come to you. One of my favorite books is a book that was written in the humor section, but it's true. It's called How to Train a Man Like a Dog in 21 Days. <laughs> one of my therapist friends recommends this to women, and they're real successful when they do this. Really? What are some of the things well, to train it's, them? It's basically about not being the pursuer. Okay. And it's that's about part of the biological game, that's isn't right. it? Yes, it's about holding your own auditioning. authority and letting them audition. Okay. They have to do the work. They have to words. do the work. We just wait, and they have to do the work. Right. Now, what is the key, do you think, to a long-term relationship? The key to a successful long-term relationship? I think it's to a probably, good marriage. I think it's pro all the marriages that I see or all the relationships I see that are successful and happy long-term are the same relationship. Years ago, Maggie Scarf wrote a book on it. It was called Intimate Partners, and she went and interviewed hundreds of successful long-term couples, and she said they all have the same system. She called it the Minneapolis-St. Paul structure. Hmm. Two independent cities, lots of traffic in and out, strong bridge between. So I would say that going out on a date with each other once a week or once every two weeks is mandatory. Mm -hmm. I always have my clients choose. One gets to pick the activity one time, the other one picks it the next time. It's on the calendar, it's not negotiable. It's real, regular reconnecting. I also think it's important to be able to resolve conflict peacefully, successfully. I also think, again, that people need to know how to handle their money in such a way that it honors the values of each person. But the most important thing is commitment and seeing that marriage is a sacrament and it's not something disposable and something you just leave when the going gets tough. You get all the support you need, you get all the advice you need and the tools you need, and you just move through it. Because guess what? Life is difficult. Right, right. Now, let's get back to sex. Okay. You talked about how birth control kind of changed the relationship between men and women. It changed the dynamics between men and women. 
what is your advice on women who, on, when you start dating and you want to, to, to have a long-term relationship with someone? Is there, oh no, don't have sex for the first three dates or the first 10 dates? Or how do you make a decision on that? Well, in a perfect world, we would have the self-control not to become involved sexually in the first 90 days because okay. that's a season. And what we know is in the world before 1965, this happened every day. That's right. So it's You made out, but you didn't have sex. That's right. And you had a lot of uh, fun doing that. And so sex was not some kind of an activity that led to intercourse. In fact, if you look at today's world, it's kind of the same thing all over again. The kids are not having the traditional sex. They're having the untraditional right. sex, more of right. the makeout stuff. Yeah, right. What are some of the questions you need to ask before you marry someone? I think you need to ask, do you envision a life that's perfect or a life that's real? I think you also need to know something about the person's relationship history because we've all got these backgrounds that have wounds with permanent toxicity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I also think we need to look at what are the lighter side of the relationship. Do we have fun together? Do we play together? Does the person have the ability to laugh at themselves when things are difficult? I think that's a huge important thing. And then I think you have to you know, look at the issue of children and families and how you're going to organize your time and really see if you support each other and make each other better. You know, Dr. Emoto was here recently and he says that we are attracted to somebody because of their vibration. And the ideal is that we get involved with somebody who raises the vibration and we're both better. So to me, if you're both better and you stay better, that's a healthy relationship. That's wonderful. How do you know you're living smart? I know I'm living smart when I can sleep well at night, when I wake up knowing that there are only two things important in the world today, which is love and gratitude. And when my relationships with other people are able to stay in harmony despite our differences. That's right. Now, important character traits to have a good long-term relationship. I think you the, mentioned abil courage. the ability to be courageous because there's lots of times when we want to give up. I think the ability to be tenacious because, again, things are going to get really tough and we're going to want to throw in the towel. I think having a sense of humor and learning to laugh at yourself is the most important thing you can do to lighten it up. I also think to have a good relationship, you have to be willing to give 51%, both partners. So there's a little equity there in the days when you're not feeling good. And I also think it's really important to acknowledge each other, to be kind to each other, and to find a way to have conflict resolution quickly, speedily, without hostility. And the warning signs that you're in a situation that you, you want to maybe marry someone, but there's some warning signs, but you're just kind of balancing it out. You're trying to figure out what to do. Are there red lights that you really need to pay attention to? Well, one of the things would be if it's not moving forward. If you find yourself wondering how the other person feels, because you should know. It should be obvious. You should be able to feel it if you find that they're spending less and less time with you. Because normally when a relationship's moving forward, the frequency pattern increases. And I also believe that it's important to know the other person's friends and family and to see how you interact with them. Because if they have good relationships with friends and family, then they're a feeling person, a person who cares about other people, and they're able to have relationships with others than just the significant one. And that, that sort of also related to your relationship with your mother. What about relationship with your father? You know, you're saying a well, man... Well, I think today it's different than it was for most people over the age of 30. And certainly in today's world, men and women uh, both co-parent. And so it's probably not as important as it used to be. But it used to be that the feeling relationship was with the mother and that she was the person who shared authority with the male. And it used to be that women thought that uh, males were so wonderful, it's like God is a man and men are gods, that they didn't ask men to live in the real world and cooperate. And so what we find is in today's world, men need to do many tasks and they need to cooperate and they need to be very androgynous, just as women have become. So I think it's important to see if the relationship with the mother originally was of that nature or if it has become that way. Whereas I would tell you that today, a man is just as important as a woman in rearing children. And so you would right. ask that very differently for people under the age of 20. So they both have to play a major role. They both in the have to play a major role. The, the and, that's, and that's the improved version of life. 
Okay, thank you so much. Thank Nina. you. It's so great to have you again. Thank you so much. And for more information on how to succeed in the mating dance, you can contact Nan at 713-520-1551 or check her website, nanhalinky.com. And please remember to visit houstonpbs.org slash livingsmart for a complete resource list of books and websites to find that special someone and feel free to share your own experiences with us. Call us with your comments at 713-743-8513 or email livingsmart at houstonpbs.org. And that's our show for today. Thank you for tuning in and remember to live smart. Be sure to watch next week when parole officer and the subject of a lifetime movie, Marilyn Gambrell, shares her moving story about breaking the cycle of violence by helping the children of incarcerated parents. I'm Patricia Gross. Have a fabulous week. Thank you.